In this video, we're going to begin a study of Aristotle's History of Animals, translated, of course, into English. Uh, the History of Animals <clears throat> provides us with what could be called a classical biology textbook that focuses on one part of biology, which is zoology, or the study of animals. What I intend to do is study through Aristotle's History of Animals as the first part of a course in classical biology, and then also study th uh, through the history of plants by Aristotle's student Theophrastus in his second classical biology course. I think this will best serve the interests of students in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. So let's begin our study in chapter one of the first book of Aristotle's history of animals. And let me just say before we begin, when we see the title, The History of Animals, <clears throat> we're not to think of this word history in the sense of chronology, as in the study of, of the chronology of historical events. What history simply means is a collection of facts. Okay, so the history of animals is simply a collection by Aristotle of what can be known about animals by observation. So the history of animals, the first book and chapter one. Let's read together. Some parts of animals are simple and these can be divided into like parts as flesh can be divided into pieces of flesh. Others are compound and cannot be divided into like parts, as the hand, for example, cannot be divided into hands, nor the face into faces. Of these, some are not only called parts, but members, such as those which, though entire in themselves, are made up of other parts, as the head and the leg the hand and the entire arm, or the trunk. For these parts are both entire in themselves and made up of other parts. All the compound parts also are made up of simple parts. The hand, for example, of flesh and sinew and bone. Some animals have all these parts the same. In others they are different from each other. Some of the parts are the same in form, as the nose and eye of one man is the same as the nose and eye of another man. And flesh is the same with flesh and bone with bone. In like manner, <clears throat> We may compare the parts of the horse and of other animals, those parts, that is, which are the same in species, for the whole bears the same relation to the whole as the parts do to each other. And in animals belonging to the same class, the parts are the same, only they differ in excess or defect. By class, I mean such as bird or fish, for all these differ if either compared with their own class or with another, and there are many forms of birds and fishes. Nearly all their parts differ in them according to the opposition of their external qualities, such as color or shape, in that some are more and others are less affected, or sometimes in number more or less, or in size greater and smaller, or in any quality which can be included in excess or defect. For some animals have a soft skin, 
In others, the skin is shelly. Some have a long bill, as cranes. Others have a short one. Some have many feathers. Others have few. Some also have parts which are wanting in others, for some species have spurs, others have none. Some have a crest, others have not. But, so to say, their principal parts, and those which form the bulk of their body, are either the same, or vary only in their opposites, and in excess and defect. By excess and defect, I mean the greater and the less. But some animals agree with each other in their parts neither in form nor in excess and defect, but have only an analogous likeness, such as a bone bears to a spine, a nail to a hoof, a hand to a crab's claw, the scale of a fish to the feather of a bird. For that which is a feather in the birds is a scale in the fish. With regard then to the parts which each class of animal possesses, they agree and differ in this manner, and also in the position of these parts. For many animals have the same parts, but not in the same position, as the mammae, which are either pectoral or abdominal. But of the simple parts, some are soft and moist, others hard and dry. The soft parts are either entirely so, or so long as they are in a natural condition, as blood, serum, fat, tallow, marrow, semen, gall, milk, in those animals which give milk, flesh, and other analogous parts of the body. In another manner, the excretions of the body belong to this class, such as phlegm, and the excrements of the abdomen and bladder. The hard and dry parts are sinew, skin, vein, hair, bone, cartilage, nail, horn, for that part bears the same name, and on the whole is called horn, and the other parts of the body which are analogous to these. Animals also differ in their manner of life, in their actions and dispositions, and in their parts. We will first of all speak generally of these differences, and afterwards consider each species separately. The following are the points in which they vary in manner of life, in their actions and dispositions. Some animals are aquatic, others live on the land, and the aquatic may again be divided into two classes, for some entirely exist and procure their food in the water, and take in and give out water, and cannot live without it. This is the nature of most fish. But there are others which, though they live and feed in the water, do not take in water but air, and produce their young out of the water. Many of these animals are furnished with feet, as the otter, and the latex, and the crocodile, or with wings, as the seagull and diver, and others are without feet, such as the water serpent. Some procure their food from the water, and cannot live out of the water, 
but neither inhale air nor water, as the akalefa and the oyster. Different aquatic animals are found in the sea, in rivers, in lakes, and in marshes, as the frog and the newt. And of marine animals, some are pelagic, some literal, and some saxatile. Some land animals take in and give out air, and this is called inhaling and exhaling. Such are man, and all other land animals which are furnished with lungs. Some, however, which procure their food from the earth, do not inhale air, such as the wasp, the bee, and all other insects. By insects I mean those animals which have divisions in their bodies, whether in the lower part only or both in the upper and lower parts. Many land animals, as I have already observed, procure their food from the water, but there are no aquatic or marine animals which find their food on land. There are some animals which at first inhabit the water, but afterwards change into a different form and live out of this happens to the gnat in the rivers. Again, there are some creatures which are stationary, while others are locomotive. The fixed animals are aquatic, but this is not the case with any of the inhabitants of the land. Many aquatic animals also grow upon each other. This is the case with several genera of shellfish. The sponge also exhibits some signs of sensation, for they say that it is drawn up with some difficulty unless the attempt to remove it is made stealthily. Other animals also there are, which are alternately fixed together or free. This is the case with a certain kind of akalefe, some of these become separated during the night and emigrate. Many animals are separate from each other, but incapable of voluntary movement, as oysters and the animal called holothuria. Some aquatic animals are swimmers, as fish and the mollusca and the malacostraca and the crabs. Others creep on the bottom, as the crab, for this, though an aquatic animal, naturally creeps. Of land animals, some are furnished with wings, as birds and bees, and these differ in other respects from each other. Others have feet, and of this class some species walk, others crawl, and others creep in the mud. There is no animal which has only wings, as fish have only fins. For those animals whose wings are formed by an expansion of the skin can walk, and the bat has feet, the seal has imperfect feet. Among birds, there are some with very imperfect feet, which are therefore called a podes, which means not having feet. They are, however, provided with very strong wings, and almost all birds that are similar to this one have strong wings and imperfect feet, as the swallow and drepanis. For all this class of birds is alike, both in habits and in the structure of their wings, and their whole appearance is very similar. The apos is seen at all times of the year, but the drepanis can only be taken in rainy weather during the summer, and on the whole is a rare bird. 
Many animals, however, can both walk and swim. The following are the differences exhibited by animals in their habits and actions. Some of them are gregarious, others are solitary, both in the classes which are furnished with feet and those which have wings or fins. Some partake of both characters, and of those that are gregarious, as well as those that are solitary, some unite in societies, and some are scattered. Gregarious birds are such as the pigeon, stork, and swan. But no bird with hooked claws is gregarious. Among swimming animals, some fish are gregarious, as the dromas, tunny, pelamis, and amia. But man partakes of both qualities. Those which have a common employment are called social. But that is not the case with all gregarious animals. Man and the bee, the wasp, and the ant, and the stork belong to this class. Some of these obey a leader. Others are anarchical. The stork and the bee are of the former class. The ant and many others belong to the latter. Some animals, both in the gregarious and solitary class, are limited to one locality. Others are migratory. There are also carnivorous animals, herbivorous, omnivorous, and others which eat peculiar food as the bee and the spider. The former eats only honey and a few other sweet things, while spiders prey upon flies. <clears throat> and there are other animals which feed entirely on fish. Some animals hunt for their food, and some make a store which others do not. There are also animals which make habitations for themselves and others which do not. The mole, the mouse, the ant, and the bee make habitations. But many kinds, both of insects and quadrupeds, make no dwelling. With regard to situation, some are troglodyte, as lizards and serpents. Others, as the horse and dog, live upon the surface of the earth. Some kinds of animals burrow in the ground, others do not. Some animals are nocturnal, as the owl and the bat, others use the hours of daylight. There are tame animals and wild animals. Man and the mule are always tame. The leopard and the wolf are invariably wild, and others, such as the elephant, are easily tamed. We may, however, view them in another way, for all the genera that have been tamed are found wild also, as horses, oxen, swine, sheep, goats, and dogs. Some animals utter a loud cry, some are silent, and others have a voice, which in some cases may be expressed by a word, in others it cannot. There are also noisy animals and silent animals, musical and unmusical kinds. But they are mostly noisy about the breeding season. Some, as the dove, frequent fields. Others, as the hoopoe, live on the mountains. Some attach themselves to man, as the pigeon. Some are lascivious, as the partridge and domestic fowl. Others are chaste, such as the raven, which rarely cohabits. 
Again, there are classes of animals furnished with weapons of offense, others with weapons of defense. In the former, <clears throat> I include those which are capable of inflicting an injury or of defending themselves when they are attacked. In the latter, those which are provided with some natural protection against injury. Animals also exhibit many differences of disposition. Some are gentle, peaceful, and not violent, as the ox. Some are violent, passionate, and intractable, as the wild boar. <clears throat> Some are prudent and fearful, as the stag and the hare. Serpents are illiberal and crafty. Others, as the lion, are liberal, noble, and generous. Others are brave, wild, and crafty, like the wolf. For there is this difference between the generous and the brave. The generous means that which comes of a noble race, the latter that which does not easily depart from its own nature. Some animals are cunning and evil disposed, as the fox. Others, as the dog, are fierce, friendly, and fawning. Some are gentle and easily tamed as the elephant. Some are susceptible of shame and watchful as the goose. Some are jealous and fond of ornament as the peacock. But man is the only animal capable of reasoning. Though many others possess the faculty of memory, and instruction common with man. No other animal but man has the power of recollection. In another place we will treat more accurately of the disposition and manner of life in each class. So there we have a reading of the first chapter of the first book of Aristotle's history of animals. One thing that you'll find is common, uh, contrary to what you'll hear modern scientists and teachers saying about the ancient philosophers is that they had a very thorough knowledge of the natural world. We'll see that all through this book of the history of the animals and we'll see this all through the book of the history of plants by Theophrastus. There is no ignorance of the natural world among the ancient philosophers, and yet this is a common stereotype that sort of created to make us assume that people who lived in the ancient world didn't know much about animals or plants or, or heavenly objects or anything in the world, and that they just sort of sat in the dark indoors and, and philosophized about the natural world, when that's not true at all. We'll see as we go through both Aristotle and Theophrastus that the ancient philosophers had a thorough knowledge of the natural world. It's also important for us to note that this book was written by Aristotle <clears throat> around 350 BC, 350 years before Christ. So this is a very ancient book and we'll see that his knowledge of animals is very thorough. 350 BC. I would, I would argue the opposite, that we, we should expect people from the ancient world to have even a greater knowledge of animals and plants because society was so much more directly agricultural. People depended directly on nature for their food, clothing, shelter, and so on. They were much more concerned with weather, um, seasons and things like that because they they didn't have many of the conveniences we had even though they had dealt with them in many different ways so just because they didn't have our conveniences or some of our modern materials maybe 
doesn't mean that they just lived exposed to the elements like some kind of cavemen, as we talk about, which may have never even existed. But what I want you to see and what I want you to, to gain is a respect for the knowledge of the ancient philosophers. They knew the natural world, and their philosophy was based on observation. It wasn't in isolation, separate from the natural world. They were in the natural world. And we'll see Aristotle explaining all these things very skillfully, full of knowledge and based on observation. So accusations of the ancient philosophers will easily see that they're not true. The other thing I'd like to note is that Aristotle's history of animals and Theophrastus's history of plants were the authoritative texts on these subjects until the modern scientific revolution, which I would argue has much more to do with a new philosophy, even a new religion, than any actual observation of the natural world. What changed in the 15 and 1600s, what changed was a philosophical uh, system that was developed not by Catholics, not by ancient moral philosophers, but by non-Catholics who were actually rebelling against Catholicism, against the authority of the church, against the wisdom of the ancients, and were seeking to create a new world, starting with a new philosophy that would lead to all kinds of changes. Uh, and use, simply used science as sort of an excuse to introduce new ideas without having to prove them philosophically or, or theologically, but being able to propose any theory really and saying, well, we're going to experiment and test it with science, with the scientific method, when really that testing never takes place. The theory is proposed, and it slowly just works itself into society as a new idea, a new philosophy, or new religion. The teaching of Aristotle and Theophrastus, as well as of Plato and other ancient philosophers, remained as the established uh, natural philosophy from the time these books were written, hundreds of years before Christ all through the Middle Ages, through the whole history of the Catholic Church, until modern revolutions in the 15, 16, 1700s, which were led by anti-Catholic religious and philosophical movements. So we'll see that modern science and ancient natural philosophy don't differ because modern science actually observed the natural world and ancient philosophy simply imagined things that they never observed, we'll find that there are two different philosophies of the world, of man, of nature, of God, and so on. And that these different philosophies are actually the cause of the different explanations of the natural world. The observations can never be different. Anything that the ancients observed must still be observed by modern scientists. And modern scientists will never observe anything that the ancients didn't observe. Now, we may say that modern scientists have tools and instruments like microscopes or telescopes, and that allows them to see different things. But what we're going to see is we're talking about animals and plants. Microscopes and telescopes really have nothing to do with the observation of plants and animals. It really has nothing to do with it. Unless we're going to make theories about plants and animals based on invisible parts of plants and animals, but that's a different philosophy. That's a different philosophy. And so I'd like you to read with me the natural history of Aristotle and then Theophrastus and Pliny, and I'd like you to see that it's false to suggest in any way that the ancients didn't have a thorough knowledge of the natural world. That's simply not true.
What's different is the philosophy. The Aristotelian philosophy, which was embraced by the Catholic Church and became known as scholasticism under St. Thomas Aquinas, and the modern, what we'll call Baconian philosophy, which uses the scientific method to propose new theories about the world that contradict not only the ancient philosophers, not only the teaching of the Catholic Church, but also sacred scripture, divine revelation itself. And I'd like to lead you through this study as we read Aristotle's History of Animals and Theophrastus' History of Plants. I hope that's a helpful introduction and in reading through book one. Study this lesson for mastery for yourself and submit the lesson assessment and we'll continue reading Aristotle's History of Animals. God bless your study.